Basic Brewing Radio is sponsored in part by the American Homebrewers Association. Want to get discounts on homebrew supplies and save money at craft breweries? Join the American Homebrewers Association and save at more than 2,300 AHA member deal locations worldwide and online. Members enjoy discounts on pints, food, and merch, and 10 to 30% off online orders. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to check out the AHA member deals in your area and join the AHA. That's homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to join the American Homebrewers Association to access thousands of members-only discounts. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, March 31st, 2022. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby, author of The Homebrew Recipe Bible and Methods of Modern Home Brewing, walks us through some popular specialty malts and grains as the next installment of our series on recipe development. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. If you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing, and thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. I've made reservations, or at least I've, I've applied for a press passes for Steve and me for the uh, the Homebrewers Conference in Pittsburgh in June. I've made a hotel reservation as well, so looks like it's going to happen. <laughs> I'm really excited about that. Uh, looking forward to seeing people in real life and tasting real beer. Uh, Steve and I are also set to get together this week to shoot a couple of video episodes and record an audio show as well. Time is flying by. It seems like just last last week that he was uh, here sampling beers and uh, talking about stuff. We're going to sample my toasted rye doppelbock and my kettle soured Brett beer that I started way back on Christmas Day. Uh, those are uh, on the uh, complete opposite ends of the spectrum, pretty much. The Doppelbach, you know, is, is dark and chocolatey and kind of rich, uh, but at the same time being, uh, you know, very cleanly fermented with the lager yeast. And the Kettle Sour is uh, is light, a bit tart, with a, a fun and funky Brett character. So I, I guess we'll do the dark one first since it's less, you know, less funky. Uh then, after we get through our video uh, shooting, Steve and I will uh, sit down and sample some tinctures that I made with uh, citrus zests, as suggested by listeners to the show. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And I plan on, uh, on tasting a bonus beer from Ivory Bill Brewing up in Xylem Springs. So you'll have to stay tuned for that. I had some leftover citrus fruit after making the uh, tinctures with the zests. So I went out and, and found a recipe for lemon lime. Lim, well, it was a lemon custard pie on the uh, YouTube video, but I added some lime in there. Spoiler. Uh, boy, that was tasty. Uh, I, I, don't make, I don't bake a lot. I don't make a lot of pies. And there's a reason for that, <laughs> because I like to eat them. <laughs> I'm on the lookout uh, for what to brew next. I've been thinking about my 15-minute uh, Amarillo ale recipe that I used to brew a lot, you know, with six pounds of of a light dry malt extract and a pound of 60-level uh, von Crystal steeped and just boiled for 15 minutes with, um, you know, a lot of hops added in that 15 minutes. I've got some Simcoe hops that I need to use for something, and that may just be the ticket or the inspiration. So let me know if you've brewed anything similar lately that would be fun to uh, brew for the summertime. Whenever I brew, I, I do it using my Warthog Electric Brew in a Bag system from our friends and sponsors Desiree and Dave of HighGravityBrew.com. I have the 240-volt system capable of brewing up to 10-gallon batches, even though I generally just brew five. Steve has the smaller 120-volt 5-gallon system. Both of us love our Warthog systems. You know, gone are the days when the, blue, the, the, the wind 
blew the heat of the propane burner away from the kettle. No more, you know, wrapping the kettle or a Rubbermaid uh, cooler in blankets and quilts, trying to maintain something close to a stable mash temperature. No more guesstimating the amount of boiling water to add to a mash to ramp up to a higher temperature rest. My Warthog system from HighGravityBrew.com takes the pain out of propane and stores away in my basement in a tidy, small footprint. HighGravityBrew.com has single and two and three vessel systems from five gallons to two barrels, and uh, they themselves brew on a professional electric system at Pippin's Tap Room, so you know what they're doing. You know that they know what they're doing. <laughs> Use the promo code EBC75BB, that's EBC75BB, to save 75 bucks off your Warthog electric gear, whether you're buying a whole turnkey system or just maybe a Warthog controller if you've already got the rest of the stuff at your house. Uh, use the code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your Warthog gear at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. Let's take a quick look into the mailbag. Nate from central Wisconsin writes, Just listen to your latest episode on recipe development. One thing that hung me up for a while was crystal slash caramel malt. Not necessarily the difference between crystal and caramel, but the, all the variations of each. For instance, why would you add Cara Pils, Cara Vienna, Cara Munich, Cara Red, versus the C20, C40, C60, etc.? Uh, Nate says, maybe worth a sh whole show or part of a show talking about caramel malts. Well, Nate, I, I hope that this week's conversation fits the bill. Uh, Chris Colby and I spend a lot of time on crystal and caramel malts, or is it caramel? Depends on where you're from. As we chat about the role of specialty malts and grains in recipe development. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks, James. We're in the uh, the third or fourth. I don't. I can't. I've already lost track. Segment of the the recipe development, and this time we're going to break it down even further in the grain bill. We talked about base malts the first time that you and I got together to talk about grain, but now we're moving over to the buckets with the uh, multicolored, you know, the darker, a little bit darker over in the grains. We're talking about specialty grains or specialty malts. And when we get into this territory, what are we talking about? Yeah, um, for like, like, and I'm not a, a brewing historian, so this is sort of, I don't take this as gospel. <laughs> but like back in the old day when they when they made malts, they were all sort of dark-ish, uh, given the, the the malting process, and um, but they still had enzymatic power or whatever. And then as uh, as malsters got better and better at producing pale colored malts, people started liking paler colored beers and the uh, sort of the brownish malts of the, the past went away, but then people still wanted beer with, with some, some darker colors. They wanted to have the, and so brewers developed uh, what we now call specialty malts as a way to, you, you take, you start with a, a beer that's brewed with pale malt, which, you know, has, has a lot of enzymatic power, has a, uh, um, a high amount of extract, uh, uh, you know, potential extract. And it's a way to take a beer brewed with that and add a little bit of some other, uh, some colored malt and add flavors and colors and, and potentially uh, other attributes to the beer. So the bulk of the beer is going to be your base malts, like we talked about last time. But the specialty malts and the specialty grains are going to add some fermentables, add some color, add some mouthfeel, you know, add a lot of characteristics that will uh, kind of take those plain base malts and turn them into more interesting beers, so to speak. Right. Yeah. And you don't have to have a lot of, of specialty grains or specialty malts to really make a difference. Generally not. And I mean, you, you also, it, it should be mentioned, you don't need special malts at all if you're just going to brew a, a completely pale beer, mm -hmm. you know, something like a, a Helles uh, or a, a German Pilsner beer uh, generally wouldn't have uh, much, if any, of, of any sort of specialty malt. It would just be all the uh, the base malt. But specialty malts, if you want something that's, you know, uh, you know anywhere from deep golden to, uh, to, to jet black, 
you need uh, some malts in there to get the color up. And then if you want, there's, you know, various, uh, especially malts have different flavors. And if you want those, you know, you've got to go to the specialty malts. And generally, uh, there may be an exception or two, but specialty grains or specialty malts are, don't do well by themselves in the mash done. Yeah, most of them you you want to mash. Uh, there are some, you know, most specifically like crystal uh, crystal malts, which are a type of caramel malt. Uh, those those you can just steep, and that's you know that was a big help in the early days of home brewing when people made you know uh, beer from like two cans of malt extract and and you know a pound of uh, crystal forty. Um, but most of them you, you most of them have uh, the the kilning to get the, the the dark color has has killed all the enzymatic power, so you need to mash these grains so that they don't any stray, uh, you know, uh, unfermentable or, or well fermentable or, or unfermentable carbohydrates get get dealt with in the mash. So you can steep these uh, either outside the mash tun, like, or if you're doing an extract beer, you can steep these in a bag, like uh, we used to do when you, we first started brewing. Uh, and still get a, a delicious beer, but also you can do things like uh, delay adding uh, some of these to the mash. Like if you want to add, you know, especially darker grains later in the mashing process, if you're trying not to extract, you know, say astringency, you can add them, you know, during the loudering process. Or you can do, uh, like we talked about uh, with the episode with Matt Giovanisi, a cold steep separate. Uh, from the mash tun, you know, if you want to do something uh, interesting like that. Uh, so there are some different ways that you can play with specialty grains and specialty malts to kind of get different effects. Yeah, there's there's a lot you can do. I think one of my one of my favorite variants, if you're going to be doing a, uh, an extract based beer, is to turn it into a partial mash beer. That way, you take your you've got your specialty grains, but you add some pale malt along with them. Um, and then you steep, quote unquote, uh, those grains at you know, uh, in the mashing range, you know, generally around 148 to 162 Fahrenheit, and you know, sort of in the in the mashing relative thickness, uh, which you know is is like sort of you know an oatmeal like consistency almost uh, a little bit lower, and you know, steep those for for you know 30 minutes or something like that. Um, you can do it in a, in a separate pot, or you, or you can do it in your kettle if you put all those in, in like a big bag, and then just when you when you're done with with steeping those the pale malt along with the, the crystal malts, okay, you've actually mashed that and you've actually made wort, so just pour that off, you know, strain out the uh, strain out the grains, and then then add your you know malt extract later in the boil. But you you can get carried away when you're de designing a recipe. You can get carried away with adding too much specialty grains or specialty malts, right? I guess it depends on the style and it depends on the the you know what you're adding in there. But you can definitely go too far. You can, yeah. As with anything, um, and and I mean, it depends critically sort of on what you want to do. Like um, if you. I, I've brewed beers before, say with 100% smoked malt, and for a lot of people that was, you know, that would be just way, way, way too much. But for me, I was like, yeah, that's pretty good. That's what I was shooting for. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you you just got to know what you're doing. Like, you know, in the in the early days of home brewing, there were a lot of sort of amber pale ales, amber ales brewed with like a, a rel what, what we what we'd think of now as a very high amount of like crystal malt in it, mm. and it, these produced. You know, they were very full bodied, uh, you know, dark amber colored or whatever. And, you know, but they might have had 15 or, you know, even 20 percent uh, uh, the grain bill as crystal caramel malt. And now, you know, nowadays we'd say, you know, between five and 10 is going to be better in most cases. Where you might, you know, some of these have unfermentable sugars in the, in the uh, specialty malts. And, and then you get, you know, this, this sweetness that doesn't go away, uh, you know, that, that doesn't ferment out. Uh, so you might, you know, if you, especially if you're having like a lower gravity beer and a, and a, and a bunch of unfermentable sugars at the end of it, you can get a kind of a sickeningly sweet uh, beer that, that is really unbalanced. Yeah. So you, you just need to know what, whatever, you know, if you're adding specialty malt, you need to know what's going to bring to the beer and, and what do you want 
And, you know, so there, there's, a, a, there's also, you know, there's a couple of mistakes you can make, I think. One is adding just too much, you know, uh, a percentage of the grain bill, having too much specialty malts in some cases. Uh, but you can also, you know, I've seen some people uh, have homebrew recipes or it's just like the, every specialty malt made, you know, makes it on the list somewhere. And, you know, my thought is like, what does that going to taste like? You know, mm -hmm. are you able to pick out uh, my sort of rule, which doesn't have to be everyone's rule, but my sort of rule when I, when I brew, if I, if I'm making a beer and it has, you know, multiple different malts, uh, I'm going to want each of those to, to, to contribute something that's noticeable. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, like some people say, oh yeah, just a hint of this and a blah, blah, blah. And it's like, nobody notices just a, a hint of anything, you know? <laughs> um, I mean, they, they just don't. There's, even, even if, even people with good palates, you know. Yeah, a, a hint of, say, something like a, a debittered black malt or something like that can make a difference in the color, I would say. Oh, sure. Yeah. But not necessarily the flavor. Yeah. And, and I mean, maybe in some cases if the, if you've got a, a good beer and it just needs just a tiny bit of something like i used to, i used to have a porter that i i used to add brewer's licorice to <laughs> and i was at the time i was sort of convinced that that little thing gave it the uh you know the extra little uh you know push over the edge that it needed and then i i ran out of brewer's licorice and brewed it once without it and i was like yeah this tastes fine i don't i don't really <laughs> notice that much of a difference so yeah, just just wave it over the kettle next time. And <laughs> so let's get into a list of of specialty malts. The first thing that comes into my mind are the crystal slash caramel malts. And I guess the first thing we got to do is is make a definition as to what what the difference is between a crystal malt and a caramel malt. Bob Hansen from Brees has a has a, a web page that where he explains it all. And basically, what what he says is that. Uh, caramel malts are malts that have caramelized sugar on the inside of them, um, and they can be made. Uh, they're made from you take uh, grain that's been malted, but it hasn't been dried before it's killed, or, or, or it hasn't been dried before it's heated. And it, you can heat it either by kilning or by roasting. And uh, malts made that way are called caramel malts, uh, but some of the some of the roasted caramel malts are called crystal malts. Crystal malts is a subset. Hmm. But, but the basic idea is they're all caramel malts. They've all got sugar that's been caramelized in the middle because the, the, you know, the grains are wet when, when they were, were starting to be heated by whatever method. Uh, the, you know, the sort of thing that goes on in your mash goes on in, inside the, the grains themselves, turns the sugar, uh, and then they ramp up the heat at the end. And that, uh, you know produces all the, the Maillard products that, that other malts have. But also, since there's the, the, just the raw sugars inside there, uh, it, it caramelizes them, and hence the name caramel malt. And you can you can do this at home yourself. And there's a video, if you could look on our YouTube channel, uh, you can make your own crystal malt, and therefore you could make your own, say, Maris Otter crystal malt, if you wanted to or experiment with, with different base malts, but you essentially get the grain wet uh, and hold it in the oven at mashing temperature. Uh, and, you know, so that there is, there is you know, the sugars inside the grains are uh, converting in, in, into their, you know, from the starches into sugars. Uh, and then you can just roast them in the, in the oven to the temperature or the, the color temperature that you like. You know, that's going above and beyond, and it's definitely something you want, don't want to do all the time. Or maybe you do, but it's a fun experiment uh, where you can, you know, kind of not exactly duplicate what they're doing at the maltster because, you know, they're they're taking the, the grain that, that hasn't been – or the malt that hasn't been dried yet. Yeah, they use green malt. Yep. And you're, you're rehydrating it to do that uh, on your right. own. You're taking malt that's already gone all the way through the malting process and then, yeah, adding – another step to, to yeah but uh, it will work you know if it works and produces something that that you like then sure yeah let's take a minute to talk about our friends and sponsors at imperial organic yeast it's easy for me to talk about them because i'm such a big fan i i always felt compelled to use a starter with a previous brand of liquid yeast that i used to use because i didn't like the lag times 
from just from pitching from the package. However, with 200 billion cells in each easy-to-open pouch of Imperial Organic Yeast, my stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore to make starters for moderate gravity five-gallon batches. Even the big Doppelbach that I lagered in my basement, you know, started out at like 1071. It was just fine with no starter at lager temperatures. I like to say my airlocks are usually bubbling before bedtime with ale pitches. That lager was bubbling before breakfast. Imperial so confident in their yeast's quality and health that their recommended shelf life is four months. And I've even gone beyond that, personally. And they've got excellent customer and technical support. If you have any questions about your fermentations, ask your local homebrew shop about Imperial Organic Yeast and check them out at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. So crystal malts and caramel malts, they they uh, come, and I should say that the, the, uh, I read an experiment recently on the Brewlosophy blog that uh, where they com- compared uh, a U.K. Uh, caramel malt and a U.S. crystal malt, and they statistically couldn't uh, tell the difference in their tasting panel. So you can almost use those interchangeably, those two things, those two uh, items in your recipe. Um, but they're roasted or they're kilned to color temperatures all the way down from right near base malt color to way uh, dark. Yeah, there's um, I mean, there's some very light colored uh, caramel malts. Uh, Carol Pills is one. Uh, so I think it's also called dextrin malt sometimes. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, very light in color. Um, but it has, it's still got the, the, the sugars inside and that adds just a little bit of, uh, you know, a, a little bit of color. And then it's all the way up to, you know, there's, uh, malts like special B that are like 150 love a bond and, you know, all through the, there's, you know, in the 30 range in the 40 range in the 60 range. And they, uh, the higher the color, the, the, just the progressively darker colored they are you know, going through, you know, 30, 40, 60 uh, are, are, you know, good for making amber beers. Uh, the, the higher ones, you know, 90, 120, 160 uh, have some, some brown aspects to it. And they also, they also just taste different because they've been, you know, uh, roasted longer, roasted or kiln, depending on how they're made. Yeah. So you, uh, you got a, you got a wide range of colors to change from, to choose from. You you got different different and you know generally progressively more intense flavors as as you go up the scale, and they all they they, uh, they all contribute uh, fermentable carbohydrates, but they also very notably contribute unfermentable carbohydrates too. So the more of any caramel type malt you add to your grain bill, the higher your final gravity is going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, if you if you had a if you had a beer that was made entirely from pale malt and one that was made from like 80% pale malt and 20% caramel malt, you know, fermented with the same yeast, same pitch rate, same everything, the, you know, the all pale malt one is going to finish at a much lower uh, final gravity than the uh, the one with uh, the, the jacked uh, caramel in it. So you're adding mouthfeel and, uh, and a bit of flavor. On the lower, the lighter end of the scale, you're not going to be adding a lot of uh, different flavor. But, you know, on the if you get a, like 120 level bond uh, crystal malt, you're going to be adding body and like raisiny dark fruit, you know, characters that are that are going to be really noticeable in your beer. And would you would you scale the percentage? You know, I guess it depends on the style you're looking for. But would you scale the percentage? Uh, contributed to the malt bill depending on the on the the love bond color for instance would you add less of say 120 love bond crystal than you would in say a 10 love bond crystal well that's interesting because you know a lot of people ask you know i've heard people say like oh my uh, uh my homebrew shop's out of crystal 30 can i add just half as much crystal 60 mm. and you can color wise that'll work out but, you know, you're adding fermentable, unfermentable carbohydrate wise, you know, that it's the weight is going to be uh, play a big role there. And also, you know, you are, whereas you might get the color, you know, one made with a pound of 
of Crystal 30 and half a pound, another beer with, made with a half a pound of Crystal 60. Color is probably going to be pretty close, but the flavor might differ some. Mm. You know, for example, if you wanted, maybe you wanted a beer that was, was fairly deep, deeply amber colored, but you wanted it reasonably dry, then you maybe use a small amount of, uh, you know, a higher colored uh, crystal malt or caramel malt. But maybe, uh, you know, maybe on the other hand, you wanted it sort of that same color, but you wanted it to have a lot of unfermented, you know, unfermented stuff in it, then add a, a large amount of a, of a lower color. And if you've got like a, if you're making like a barley wine, you know, and you're, and you're scaling up, uh, say, uh, you know, pale ale, and you're making like a, you know, a double IPA or a barley wine or something like that, you wouldn't necessarily scale up the, your crystal malt proportionally because you're already going to have a higher finishing gravity, you know, since it's a bigger beer. And it seems like to me that you wouldn't want to like double the amount of crystal malt that you <laughs> in your in your double IPA, you know. Yeah. Uh, and definitely a double IPA, you wouldn't. You'd you'd want to basically do away with it. Uh, any special malts, or at least get them to a, a low level in a, in a uh, uh, in a barley wine. You know, you'd want. Uh, to keep the level low, like maybe, maybe as as you know, amount the same amount you'd use in a pale ale, but not uh, not anymore, just mm. because just add more and maybe even less because you know, and, and depending on how you collect and process your wort, if you completely sparge the grain bed and then have to you know have to boil down ten gallons down to down to five, that's going to add you know color and and um, unfermentability to the uh, is that a word? Unfermentability. Sure. Uh, <laughs> to the word. It is now. <laughs> in my in my uh, pale ale uh, malt bill used to be you know ten pounds or uh, four and a half kilograms of of uh, just American pale two row, and then one pound of sixty Lovabon crystal or four hundred fifty grams of you know sixty Lovabon crystal, and that was just my go to, you know, simple pale ale. A malt bill, and it, I haven't done that in a while, but it made for some tasty beers. Uh, so that's a little; it's a little less than ten percent of the of that malt bill. Uh, you said that uh, that you could sometimes put up to twenty percent of crystal malt in there. That that seems like a that seems like a lot. That'd be the for me. That'd be the top end. I mean, um, people have done it. Uh, I, I I don't think you. I'm very sure you wouldn't find many commercial beers with that. But you know. As home brewers, you know if, that, if that's what you want, go for it. But like, <laughs> sort of typical uh, for for a pale ale, say around ten percent of the grain bill is is pretty much how it goes. If you've you know if you've read most say Sierra Nevada clones, they're you know nine pounds of pale malt and a pound of uh, uh, of crystal, you know either crystal forty or crystal sixty, you know something in that in that ballpark at least. So. But you know, for am for an amber, a little more sweet, a little more full bodied, yeah, you could you could bump that up a little bit. Um, and again, and again, for me, twenty would be way too much. I'm usually I I, I I like drier beers. So like if I'm making a barley wine, there's it's pale malt and you know, just a tiny amount of colored malts because I figure it's already gonna you know it's already gonna finish high. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think I think that uh, crystal malts and caramel malts are, are some of my favorite specialty grains. It seems like the the color range is so diverse and wide, uh, and the flavors that you get out of it are are nice, and you know especially it gives you a bit of mouth feel. Uh, so for for most of my home brewing career, you know that's that's where I've lingered the <laughs> the most in my recipes, you know, and, and in the bins. Um, but there, but you know, but there are a ton of other uh, specialty malts out there, specialty grains. I right. keep saying specialty grain grains because there there are a couple of these things that aren't malts. But we'll get into that right. <laughs> in a little bit. Uh, so let's talk. Anything else you want to say about crystal malts or caramel malts? Yeah, well, like you said, they're they're very popular. Probably the probably along with with roasted grains as a as you know the the two big. Uh, you know, classes of, of specialty malts. And, uh, I mean, I remember there was a, a time in home brewing when like basically every recipe had a care, you know, had some caramel malt presence to it just because people thought uh, apparently, you know, that you just automatically needed to add some 
you know, a little later, people start realize, oh, you know, you know, it doesn't, you know, if if you don't want caramel flavor, don't add caramel malt, mm. you know. Mm. But um, but they're certainly, yeah, the most one of the the largest, most diverse, and most popular uh, classes of or groups of uh, specialty malts. And especially if he, I mean, nowadays we're, you know, our, our ABV tolerance has, has gone up. But in the, you know, in the beginning, if you're making like a 4% pale ale or something like that, some, you know, a, a bit of a crystal malt would help you on your mouthfeel and, you know, make the beer a bit more substantial. Um, but as I think as the gravities have gone up, uh, maybe they're less, you know, the people lean on them a little less than they used to. Also, the real old school home brewing recipes that were just malt extract and then steeped caramel malt uh you you get the aroma of, of actual malt in your uh uh beer from mm. from steeping the caramel malts because the the malt extract itself that's uh, uh, most of those aromatics have been blown off in the in the uh you know uh what do you call it concentration period when they when they boil it down under under super low uh pressure and mm. and 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 not very high temperature, but you still, you know, the the most aromatic compounds within that get, you know, go out the smokestack. Let's move on to melanoidin slash aromatic malts. What are those? Yeah. Um, also, there's in German some some more called brow malts. They're um, they're basically just. I, I like to just think of it as a as a multi malt. You know, if you if you want something that tastes, you know, and you, and you know what what taste is described as malty, you know, where like a a, a beer made from all Pilsner malt is going to have a light malty taste. If you make it from all Vienna malt, it's going to have a slightly more malty taste. If you make it from, you know, all Munich, it's a slightly more malty taste. Like melanoidin is sort of a concentrated version of of you know a dark Munich. Um, Although you can add you can add quite a bit of it to your malts, um, and and some people say, uh, at least some home brewers I've heard say that it sort of substitutes uh, for a decoction mash. If you want your your beer to taste like it's been decocted, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit of melanoid malt will do that for you. Um, yeah, and so you know it adds a little little bit of reddish color at, at high high amounts. Um, and, and you can add quite a bit, up to twenty, you know, around twenty percent is is not uncommon. Mm. And I don't know, I, I've read uh, some places that you can do up to fifty. I've never done that myself. Wow. And that, yeah, it seems to be like blowing your doors off <laughs> with the maltiness. But again, you know, if, if if you're a home brewer, why not? If that's what you want. So yeah, it's just a, it adds some it adds some color and, and some malty, you know, malty flavors. I I added a pound of it uh, to my toasted rye uh, doppelbock that I just uh, put on tap the other day. Uh, of course, I haven't re- brewed the recipe without it, so I don't know what the difference is. But, you know, I think Charlie Papazian, when we interviewed him at his house, I think that was one of his secret tricks back then was, was adding a bit of melanoidin to, you know, to get that uh, decoction, decoction wang or whatever you might want to call it. <laughs> yeah, it shows up in a lot of... Uh... A lot of sort of German beers, along along with a with a healthy dose of Munich, you know, you put a decent amount of Munich, and then the, the, for the kicker, you put in you know a little bit of melanoidin malt on top of that. Biscuit or victory malt? Yeah, biscuit malt's pretty easy to to, to describe. It tastes like biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you're like, hey, I like biscuits, and I want the taste of biscuits in my beer, well. I'm, now, the, for you. are these American like breakfast biscuits, or are these you know like uh, you know UK uh, sugary treat bris- biscuits? That's the that's the question. That's a good question. I think it's more the the UK thing because it's a uh, biscuit is a uh, or most malts labeled biscuit are UK malts, and, and Victory is a. I think that might even be a trademark of Brees, but it's the same malt, um, or the same you know shooting for the same thing. But yeah, these are um, there. Are, there are certain English ales that that have quite a bit of, of biscuit in them. And, and if you've if you were to taste it, and someone would say that's biscuit malt, like you'd never in your life forget what that's like. Mm. There was a there was a guy in my homebrew club who used to just he would love biscuit malt, and so he brewed all these English ales, and they all they're all he was good. He was a good brewer, 
but it was just like you tasted them, um, you know, when a beer was coming around, you're like, oh, I know who brewed this. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes like biscuits. Yeah. So, so this is a, yeah, this is just a malt just killed a little bit different to give it uh, um, the, the biscuit like flavor. And, and they're generally, they don't add a ton of color, uh, a little bit more. They're a little darker than uh, pale malts, but, but not by a ton. Traditionally, how much, you know, what percentage of the malt bill would this make up? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I would, for me, 15% would be the, like the, that's, you know, biscuit lover. Uh, <laughs> you son know, son and, of a biscuit eater. <laughs> probably, you know, probably if I was going to brew something with it, I, I would probably be more like two and a half percent, you know, because like a little bit of that for to me can be really good. But too much of it is just like, I don't know, it's just, you know, but that's, <laughs> that's my preference, personal preference and doesn't have to be everyone else's. Moving down uh, or darker in the in the color, we have brown malt and or amber malt. Yeah, these are two malts that uh, used to be prior to uh, pale malts being you know widely produced. These were two types of malts that are you know they're basically just they're malted in the normal way and then they're they're just kiln to that color. Um, and historical versions, uh, they were killed in such a way that they still had. Um, their enzymatic power you could mm. you could brew with 100 percent brown malt in the old days and it would it still convert itself um generally unless you're finding a, a maltster that's doing some special historical version you know that's not going to be the case now and so they're just going to be a darker uh color and uh brown malt you see it in a lot of sort of porter and, and brown ale recipes especially those that are, are trying to mimic historical beers and amber malt uh you know, you can see it in, in sort of milds or, you know, uh, some bitters and brown ales. You know, they're they're both very very Britishy uh, malts. And then you know, if, if you're making very sort of English style ales, th- those are two malts that if you can find them, you can consider. I like the character of brown malt. It's it's a like a toast. To me, it's it's toasty. You know, it's like a toasted bread kind of a thing on my palate. Uh, just a, it adds a nice little la- layer of uh, you know complexity, you know, in a, in a brown beer. Yeah, what is it? Fuller's Porter, like every every clone recipe I've ever seen of it, it has a lot of brown malt in it. It's that sort of, um, not quite. It, it it's it makes the dark beer, but not quite as aggressively roasty. How much uh, would you put in of the of either the brown or the amber? I guess it depends on the style. Yeah, brown malt, I mean, well, I mean, in the old days, you could go up to 100%. Mm. Um, these, you know, I would say, and this is just me, but I'd say about 25% in a modern beer is all you'd want to use and then round it out if needed with other uh, roasted malts Wow. or dark malts. So 25% maybe, um, and maybe like 10 to 12 would be more of a, a reasonable range, I would think. And then amber malt's less. That um, tends to be a little bit more uh, sort of uh, gives aggressive, weird, you know, quote unquote, weird flavors at, at too too high. You know, at, at five, maybe maybe up to seven and a half. Hmm. Interesting though. I mean, if you if you like it, <laughs> then then go ahead and add more. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you're a home brewer. It's your beer. You can do what you want. <laughs> Our friends Ricky and Kelly of Groenfell and Havoc Meaderies in Vermont are releasing something brand new that they're very excited about. It's a tea-based mead called Smoke on the Mountain. If you follow Groenfell on the socials, you might have seen a picture of a glass of Smoke on the Mountain next to the fermenter that's been its home. Uh, Smoke on the Mountain is a limited release and is available for presale right now on Groenfell.com, so you might want to get in there. Uh, Who knows how long it'll last? It's described as a mellow cup of tea enhanced by smoky pepper, bright hibiscus, and juicy lemon, brewed with maple-infused merkin chili and hibiscus from runamuck maple, then rounded out with Ceylon black tea and lemon. And now that's a fun sounding spring and summer drink if I've ever heard one. And at, and at 5.2 ABV, it's, it, it would be great for sipping on the porch or maybe dangling your feet in the lake on a dock. 
Check out Smoke on the Mountain along with all the other honey-based deliciousness at family-owned and operated Grunfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. Roasted malts, going even darker, roasted malts and grains. There's a lot of a lot of malts that are very highly roasted. Uh, there's chocolate malts, and and those come in a you know a range from sort of very lightly you know a 250 love a bond to you know sort of a more traditional English or more modern traditional English uh, chocolate malt around 350, and then some of them even go up to 500, and then you've got just plain roasted malt too. Uh, and then, you, and then you've got black panton malt, which is the same thing, essentially, uh, black malt. And then you've got, you've also got roasted unmalted barley, mm-hmm. which is used a lot in dry stouts. And, the, you know, there's also roasted wheat malts and there's, you know, any any type of malt that's made, uh, or, you know, base malt that's made rye, you know, some somebody's made a, a roasted <laughs> version of it. Uh, you, you know, you might not be able to find it, but. Like I know, roasted wheat malls are pretty easy to find these days. Those got somewhat popular in the past and haven't gone away. Yeah, would you would you characterize like a like a debittered, you know, like a midnight wheat or or something like that in the you know roasted uh, yeah. malt category? Oh, definitely, yeah. And so with, with roasted malts, there's like you said, there's the debittering or dehusked versions, which are supposedly, uh, you know, the, like the same malt but less. Uh, uh, less aggressively flavored, less acrid, I guess, is, or, or which is another, yeah, yeah. Ch- to me, chocolate malt is more uh, coffee than chocolate, maybe. Yeah, uh, like a lot of malts, uh, the name of it, you, you can't assume that it tastes, you know, exactly like the description. Um, I mean, caramel malts are pretty close. The, you know, you definitely get a hint of caramel, but you know, like biscuit malts, again, it's like what kind of biscuit is this, you know? Um, and chocolate malt is one where, you know, it, it doesn't really make a, you know, a, a cacao flavored, you know, uh, it, it's, it's the, the roasting profile is similar to, you know, to the roasting pr- uh, profile of cacao nibs that, you know, that become processed into chocolate, but the, the flavor is different. And then also in, in chocolate malts, there's a whole range of colors and different maltsters and, you know, you can get two, two malts labeled chocolate malt and they can be actually fairly, di- fairly different. Mm. And black patent gets the, uh, the tag of being ashy sometimes, but we've done experiments and tastings with, with black patent. And to me, it's, it's more sweet than ashy. I don't get, you know, like an acrid, you know, ashy character out of black patent. It's, it's a sweeter kind of, uh, uh, dark character yeah black patent is 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 interesting or black malt um it gets it, it got a really bad reputation in in early home brewing you know people say like oh you can't add more than you know like a couple percentage of it and it's acrid and burnt and uh, and you know here's the thing it, it's not acrid or burnt i mean acrid and burnt describe something are descriptors for something that has, have been combusted mm. okay. and black patent malt uh you know if it combusts in the, in the roaster that you know that burns up and they don't sell it <laughs> they, they, they make sure it doesn't it's it's very darkly roasted that's for sure and it's an intense roast flavor but that's different than acrid or burnt and another interesting thing about it unlike uh uh roasted barley which is unmalted uh they all the aromatics from black, black patent malt get a, a leave from from the roaster mm. and so it's actually if you you know if you take uh a handful of, of roasted barley just roasted unmalted barley you know like the kind of use or stouts and put it to your nose it's like oh that smells like coffee but if you take you know the same size handful of black patent you smell like it, it really doesn't smell like anything mm. um and it's you know you can use it as a flavor malt like uh sierra nevada stout used to be uh, you know, black malt was was their dark, and and it, had, it actually had a very sort of mellow roastiness to it. Um, and a, another thing that uh, black malt is great for, um, black malt or black patent, is 
you know, I love it for like color correction. If you've got a beer and like, yeah, this looks pretty good, but like a couple shades darker, but you don't want to change the flavor. Um, yeah, put in, you know, a couple ounces for a five gallon batch, put in a couple ounces of black patent, two or three, and you'll, you'll bump it to like one, you know, one color darker. And so how much of a percentage, what's, what's the upper end? Like if you're making a porter or a stout of, uh, you know, the roasted malts and grains, would you put in there? Around 10%. Like if you're brewing, if you're brewing, you know, the classic sort of Guinness clone for home brewers is 90%, you know, malts and then the, uh, the, the flaked uh, barley and then, you know, 10% uh, roasted, uh, roasted barley. Um, so that's right around 10%. And a lot of porters too, you know, uh, there will be a mix of say chocolate and and one of the you know either black malt or or uh, roasted barley and you know right around 10% for for beers right around 5% ABV about 10% roasted malt gives you you know a dark beer and then if you if you're making bigger stronger ones uh you know um you know imperial stouts you they can add considerably more uh percentage wise of the dark grains hmm. Because uh, just because it'll take it, you know. Um. So that's another example of of you know people who may not know much about you know beer recipes may think that you know that's such a dark beer. It's got to be like you know half of the half of the malt bills got to be dark stuff, you know. But it's not. It's like mostly you know the vast you know majority of the of the of the grains are pale going in there. It's just that it's just a small amount of these deeply dark, uh, you know, malts and, and grains uh, can really make a huge impact on the beer. Yeah. Then they also, um, multiple different maltsters make uh, extracts, uh, like liquid extracts of these very dark grains that are, it's actually the, um, you know, they turn it into wort and, and cook it down and, and you can add. Uh, I, like I know Brees has one and, and Wireman has one and you know you can add the small amounts of these uh, liquids and you know it turns the, the color changes very drastically but the, they're typically very uh, relatively flavor and aroma neutral I mean if you, you know, if you had dumped in a bunch you would eventually get it but acidulated slash acid slash sour malt yeah um these are basically just pale malts that have then been sprayed with a sprayed with a liquid that, that contains like a bunch of lactic acid bacteria. Then that just sort of soaks into the husk, and when you when you stir it into your your mash, uh, it, it just drops the pH. It's um, I think it's a, basically a workaround for for people who want to be Reinheit Skibot compliant because you can't just go add you know uh, there's no paragraph about acids in the you know it's just malt uh <laughs> hops water um so but if you if you have acid malt you add a little bit of that and it'll drop your ph if you need it so and that adds uh you know it's a pale malt it's it adds no color basically um or you know no more than a, like a pilsner malt would and you you know it's used in small amounts because you're um you're just adjusting you know, just generally just used for adjusting the mash pH. So like five percent is probably the most, you know, depending on depending on your water um, that you would ever want to add of that. And I think a lot of people use a a bit of uh, acidulated or sour malt uh, t in their kettle sours, you know, to start the uh, start the pH to get to be lower. You know, so that the lactobacillus can can have sort of a head start on the uh, work, the, you know, the kettle souring process. Yeah, you essentially just like adding acid, or, or you know, or adding lactic acid bacteria. Sorry. Uh, smoked malts. Now, uh, you know, you were you talking about these as specialty malts, but you and I both have made a hundred percent smoked malts uh, beers. Mine was uh, from. Uh, using smoked malt from Sugar Creek Malting Company, uh, and their smoked malt was delicious, but not as smoky. It didn't smell as smoky, you know, in in its uh, 
grain form as the you know the bins at the homebrew store do. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, you know it's it's way smoky, but it's not like overpowering. I still have a couple of bottles of that in the fridge, and I think when you and I are done talking, I think I'm going to go get one because that <laughs> it sounds good right about now. But but the smoked malt. At least, uh, you know, the ones that we've used have enough enzymatic power to be base malts, uh, but they're most most likely or most often used as an adjunct or as a specialty malt in in smoked beers. Yeah, because um, it, it's almost always, you know, pale malts that are smoked over hardwood, although there are a few peat smoked malts. And, you know, like Schlenkerle, uh, Schlenkerle rock beers are sort of the – yeah, one of the more more famous versions of that, and they that that brewery still actually smokes their own malt over uh, beech wood, and uh, the Alaskan smoked porter, uh, you know, sort of the first uh, you know American smoke beer that made some you know some splashes in in the beer beer culture here. That that's they they, they go to a salmon fishery and, and smoke their malt over alder, and you know so it's usually pale malts over hardwood. And, you know, there are cherry smoked malts available uh, commercially, probably others. Uh, you know, you can use pecan, you can use apple, you, you know, you know, basically if you're, uh, you know, if you're a barbecuer and you, you know, you know what different hardwood smokes, you know, you can smoke your own malt. And it's, it's fun. I, I've done that. You just take a, take a screen door, mm-hmm. you know, screen door mesh, um, not painted or anything just raw screen door stuff cut it to the so it fits over the the grate of your grill and you know just wet your very lightly wet your uh you know just like with a spray bottle your malt and spread it out and and then put some you know have some smoke underneath it yeah yeah i've done that too and that way you could do you know like a hickory smoked beer or an applewood smoked beer you know or something that you might not be able to find uh commercially but boy that the, the alaskan smoked porter that's a that's a tasty beer um yeah that's a good one yeah I, I personally love the schlankerla beers i mean i remember the first time i tried that i was just like oh my god what is this this is awesome <laughs> and it's it's like people either the, the funny thing about smoked beers and I, and I think we've even mentioned this on the show before but people either love them or hate them mm-hmm. people are like oh this people uh, Wow, this is like tasting a campfire, and then other people are like, ah, oh, this is like tasting a campfire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to the uh, the Great American Beer Festival, uh, and the Alaskan the Alaskan brewery had a a vertical tasting. They had you know like the current year, and then two years previous, and then two years previous to that of their you know their smoked porter, and boy, that was fun. Uh, yeah. I I usually don't. Uh, encourage people to age their beers. You know, a lot of a lot of times, especially if they're big, you know, hoppy beers. Uh, I right. like I like to drink them fresh. But uh, the way the smoke character evolved over time, uh, it was really interesting and really delicious. So, uh, you know, it's neither here nor there. But uh, but that's something that you might think about. Yeah, and then, I mean, smoke has been used to preserve foods for a while. So maybe it may. You know, I, I've never read any actual studies about it, but maybe it, maybe it helps and i know like a weird thing about smoked beers i know they have the reputation that that the smoke character can kind of come and go like if you if you brew a batch and you, and you tried one beer of it a week you know some, some weeks it'd be like oh this seems pretty you know smoky and other weeks it would it would seem less so and you know i don't know if that's i don't know if that's verifiably <laughs> scientifically correct but it's it's certainly I, I've, I've heard that opinion more than once well, in and that, from, in, in, smoked beers, I, yeah, I'll, I would agree. In the in that vertical tasting, uh, the smoke character didn't didn't diminish over time, but it did. Uh, I wish I had took some tasting notes or something, but it seemed like it was like more fruity over time, and that may be because you know maybe the you know there was a little bit of a staling of the malt, uh, you know, character to some you know a little bit of oxidation, maybe I don't know, but mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, it was delicious. So you've got one more item on on our list, but I think I think that might fit into our next conversation about adjuncts. Yeah, because this isn't a malt. Yeah, it's just a. So it's not really roasted or or done anything to other than well, like, yeah, no spoilers. We we can't spoil it. We gotta <laughs> let's save that one for next time. 
Uh, and there and there are a ton of of specialty malts and specialty grains coming out, especially you know with the small roaster or the small uh, 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 maltsters coming on board. Uh, but this is you know this is kind of a good basic uh, discussion about what you know what people are looking at you know when they go in the homebrew store. So I think that's I think it's a, another good chapter to the series. Mm, I agree. <laughs> awesome. Look forward to the next time. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, thanks again to Chris. I think we're making progress on this recipe development topic. We'll dive even deeper next time. Let me know what you want to hear along these lines. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long. 